The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to another uh, episode of Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host, and today I'm joined with a special guest, uh, Bob Duffy. Uh, he is a Civil War reenactor. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, we're just passing Memorial Day, and uh, I think it'd be appropriate to uh, talk about uh, one of the one of our biggest conflicts. Really, we've lost more people in the Civil War. Six hundred thousand men wow. died. Amazing. Uh, and uh, just talking with you off camera, I'm, I'm floored with how much uh, information. You've been doing this for 33 years. Yes. What got you into this? Well, as a child, I was around during the centennial. And there were TV programs. National Geographic had features on it. their magazines. And there were TV commercials and even kids' toys aimed at that aspect. And there were phonograph records and Civil War music. So I grew up with that time period. But... I basically forgot about it in the 1970s. And a friend of mine, his younger brother had a friend who did some Civil War reenacting for a summer. And he told me some of his stories. And I thought that was quite interesting. But then when I was a lieutenant in the New York State Guard, I was researching my regiment. And I found that there were people who were reenacting my regiment. Oh, interesting. So I contacted them, oh. and um, from August to that winter, I communicated with them, and then I said, well, how can I join you? And they said, fine, we'd be glad to have you with you. Mm. So they helped me get into the community and get the equipment, and um, in the spring, I went to my first reenactment, got to shoot black powder guns at other people and have them fall <laughs> down and play dead, Right. and got to meet the public who came out to see us and explain to them about the Civil War and the history. Now, have you been in any kind of backgrounds for movies or anything like that? Yes. When they've filmed movies or programs about the American Civil War, they look to Civil War reenactors the same way if you were filming a circus picture mm. and you wanted someone who really knew how to juggle. Right. So they would look with someone with that talent. Mm -hmm. So they look for Civil War reenactors because as reenactors, we don't have to be told how to act like a Civil War soldier. Right. It's not taking a person off the street and putting them in a uniform. We, if they just say, march across the road, we know how to form up the people who are officers and sergeants, know the responsibilities, and on film, it comes through that we know what we're doing. And this is because you've researched it, you've, you basically lived it in, in the reactments over and over and over yes. again, so it becomes a second nature yes. to you. I mean, right here on camera, you're drinking out of a tin cup. Now, I'm sure that when you go to a regular hotel or yes. restaurant, you, you take a different cup to you. Yes. This, now, is that a tin or is This it? is tinned iron, tin steel. Right. And the reason it's black is because I've boiled water on a campfire and the soot turns the metal black. Okay. Right. And that's the way they, they cooked their foods because the army gave uncooked food to the men back in those days. They didn't cook the food and give it to you like an MRE today. You put it in your cup and you. Right. You they just gave put the on. men, the, the meat they gave was preserved in salt, it was cured, not cooked. They gave coffee beans whole, sometimes green, to the men to make coffee. And they gave hard bread to the men for marching rations, which is nicknamed hardtack. I have some of those here. I'll and, show you and them And why later. did they give it to them like that? Well, when you're not in an army base, you need food that you can put in a box and ship to the men. Right. And that was field rations by today's terms. Right. In those days, they called it marching rations. And it seems inconvenient today to think about someone being given nine days worth of food at one time and being told, hold on to this food because this is your food for the next week and a half and you have to carry it with you. Interesting. Speaking of carrying, I asked you uh, before we got on camera, 
if somebody wanted to march down south or what was the average marching on a daily basis? If there was a situation where the men could hear the sound of a battle, they could hear the cannons booming in the distance, and the orders were given, hurry, your comrades need you, then they could march 20, 24 miles in a day. And then fight? Yes. As there are numerous stories of men who went straight from marching directly into the battle. And these stories, of course, make telling reading. And the Battle of Gettysburg is one of the most important battles, and there are several instances where men marched quickly into, up to the city and without hesitation were told, go over there and attack. Interesting. I, I also asked another question, but, and I want to ask it again. But during this particular time of history, the Indians are still around. Yes. And uh, tell us a little bit about how... how Which is interesting because there was actually a congressional committee to investigate the conduct of the war that held hearings on whether or not the Confederates were using Indians as units. Oh, no way. Now, the problem with that was the reason we're investigating is because the Indians would not abide by the rules of war. The Indians would kill wounded, for example. They would not take prisoners. Well, there was no G Geneva Convention back right. then, was there? Right. right. So that was the thing is that basically they were saying, are you using troops which will be acting in an inhumane fashion? And they found that they actually were using some, especially out in like Arkansas and Missouri, there were some Indians. So that, in, by that standard back then, that was very unethical, obviously. Oh, yes, obviously. yes. By using savages, if you well, will. It's, you have to remember that this was Americans fighting Americans. Mm -hmm. And in a battle, if you were wounded in the arm or in the foot, you would just sit down on the battlefield and the enemy would bypass you. They wouldn't stop and shoot you. If you were out of combat, they were only interested in the other men that were shooting back. So the idea of somebody going around and, and uh, killing wounded people was just so outrageous, almost... Um, um, beyond the, the pale completely. What happened to the prisoners of war? Well, it's interesting because in the first three years of the war, if you were captured, there was a good chance that you would be brought before an officer of the other side, and he would ask the group of you prisoners who would accept parole. And if you said, I accept parole, you would be taken aside and you would swear an oath. Mm -hmm. Swearing was very important back in those days, before God really made a big difference. You would swear an oath not to bear arms against the Confederacy of the Union until properly exchanged. Mm. And then you would be released back to your side. And, and it was an own. honor system. The Union Army actually had a camp in Maryland, Camp Parole, where these men who were paroled were sent, and they just stayed in this camp until a parley could be arranged between the Southern forces, and they would exchange a list of men, 100 privates, two captains, one general, and they would switch. How, how does that rate compare to the warfare of today? Well, that's the situation people look at because mm. in those days, if you read about these stories, it is stirring, and you can see there is a certain amount of honor, and there are stories. Where did this honor come from? Everyone was raised that way back in those days. People, everybody went to church. There were uh, social organizations. The Masons were a very active organization, too, and they helped people that were Masons. Mm -hmm. There were people who were... Um, People from towns, people from their town would send a representative to the battlefield to look after the men from their town who were wounded. Walt Whitman went down to Washington, D.C. to find his brother who was wounded and take care of him. People just naturally had that feeling. They, the idea of being brutal was um, something we haven't thought about back then. There were no horror movies back then. Now we're used to seeing blood splattering. Yeah, but in those days, no. We can, we can look at some of the way the Indians were treated. Yes. And, and we could say, well, okay, we were civil to each other, but yet they, they were killed like buffalo in the plain, just, just, just well, butchered. Well, it, it, it's interesting because the Army, Army regulations covered dealing with Indians quite clearly because the Army was responsible for protecting the Indians. Mm. It was settlers and people who moved into the territory that committed most of the offenses with the Indians, unfortunately. Right. The Indians didn't have the idea of private property. Right. So if you went west and plowed a field to make a farm and started growing corn, you might look across your field and see a troop of Indians walking across your, farm, your plowed field. 
and you would go outside of your house and say, hey, hey. get off my, <laughs> right. my farm. And they would say, what do you mean your farm? It belongs to everybody. Right. And that's where the trouble would start. I see. Interesting. Oh, also, that's... it's interesting because <laughs> there were Confederate prisoners in prison camps that the army went to them and they said, listen, we need some troops on the frontier because of some Indian trouble. If you join the Union Army under these conditions, we will guarantee that you will not have to shoot at other Southerners. We will put you in a blue uniform, send you out to Minnesota, Wisconsin, Montana Territory, Nebraska Incredible. Territory, and you can get three square meals a day, Army uniform, a doctor to look after you, and you won't have to fight against your Southern friends. And quite a few did. What a bizarre war. What a bizarre... Now, tell me a little bit about habeas corpus in, in Lincoln during this particular well, time. The, first of all, the Constitution specifically allows the president to suspend habeas corpus under certain conditions. And under it, certain yeah, conditions, right. which are? Well, I don't remember this, the exact one, but uh, insurrection and armed rebellion, I believe, is one of them. So getting yeah, into yeah, a little yeah. politics today, yeah, yes. we've had, uh, we have the NDAA right now, which suspends habeas corpus, and we're not fighting each other. No. Well, it, in reality, the times that the habeas corpus was suspended was when somebody was doing something that was judged to be against the war effort. And there were cases of newspaper editors who were locked up. Oh. And it was habeas corpus because they were inciting people. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. But they weren't tortured. Right. They were just, just put away from the newspaper press for a while. Well, now they're being investigated. Obviously. Well, yes. Well, there were people who complained back in those days because there were yeah. newspaper people on both sides of every issue. Most towns had several newspapers, and you can usually, the newspapers usually went along a party line, Democratic or Republican. So after a major skirmish, a major battle, uh, a lot of bloodshed, was there time to gather the dead and then start fighting Well, that's again? one other interesting thing about the Civil War is that Usually, during a Civil War, there was a battle which lasted a day or so. And it may go for a month before there was another battle. It's not like World War II, where every day the men were facing each other, shooting and pressing the enemy back, firing, moving, firing, moving. During a Civil War, it usually was a case where they, they, they had a battle, and then both sides pulled back, and the next day they waited to see who was going to move. And sometimes one side or the other just pulled back. And when Grant took over during the wilderness in 1864, three years into the war, when he fought a battle, and the next day he had his men continue pressing forward, the soldiers by that time cheered because they realized that this is the way to get the war over with. Right. Otherwise, Don't give the enemy time to recover. Right. So tell me about the, uh, the industrial complex during that period. Oh. You, you said that, that it was just massive. I, I always understood it in... I'd never really studied it, mm. really, like you have. But that we just had so much in the North, that's why we, we beat the South. Well, let me give you one idea. The Southerners had to start a Navy. They had 11 states that seceded. There was not a single facility in those 11 states that could make a drive shaft for a ship's propeller. Not a single facility. There okay. was only one facility in all those states that could roll iron to make armor plating. One facility. There were several facilities that could cast cannon that converted and were modified during the war. But when the war began, there was only one facility that could cast cannon. So how did they fight such a, an amazing battle? Well, the uh, Northerners realized war. that from the beginning. And it was interesting because it was the Army General, General Winfield Scott, who was a very old man at that time. He, he was wise enough to realize that he was too old to fight, so he basically resigned. There was no policy for retirement. But he said, if we prevent the southern states from getting supplies from the outside, they can't fight a war. So he came up with the Anaconda Plan, which was to send U.S. ships to blockade every southern port to prevent war goods from coming in. Hence, we have the submarines, though, right? Didn't well, they? that's why they had the Hunley to break this. And the, the famous ship, the Merrimack, which was named after our river. The U.S. Navy named ships after rivers back then. Now, it was originally called the Merrimack, but when it was rebuilt by the Confederates, they called it the Virginia, but nobody really used that name. Everybody called it Merrimack. So that, the idea of that ship was to break the blockade. 
It was a completely armor-plated ship. And the United States realized that something was being built down in Virginia because they could never really keep that much of a secret. Right. So you know, the northern effort was to build a ship to try and deal with that. And the end result was in April of, uh, in March of 1862, we had an unusual situation where you have one indestructible ship fighting another indestructible ship. That was the Monitor versus the Merrimack. And the shutters, the gun port shutters for the Monitor were made here in Nashua. Oh, is that right? There is a, there is a granite uh, pylon with a bronze plate on it commemorating that fact with a little raised relief design of the USS Monitor. Oh, they had to make that ship in such a hurry, they had 100 days to build it, that they gave, they farmed out contracts to different iron factories, and Nashua had one that made the gun port stoppers. The idea being that when the guns were being reloaded, they would stop the gun port so the enemy shells could not come in. Now back then, if you were wounded, the medicine was uh, quite uh, uh, Barbaric. Yes. Back, back those days. They didn't have anything other than a bullet to bite on. As Civil War reenactors, many of us choose to study certain aspects of history and recreate that, and, and we research it and we portray it. There is a whole field of people who study Civil War medicine. There is a museum now of Civil War medicine. It only took two years of college to be a physician or a doctor back in those days. So most people look at it and they say, I could be a doctor by their standards. And we, at that time, the germ theory was not accepted. Oh, really? So there were problems with cleanliness. But America, being a relatively new country, didn't have as many germs as Europe did. Mm. So we had situations where people were shot through the chest, in the front, out the back, and still lived, and were treated in hospitals. But gangrene was a constant battle yes. on the field. Yes, they, that's why there were so many amputations. Because I like to explain to people, they say, why are there so many amputations? I say, well, if you were in a car crash and got seriously hurt, they could take you to a hospital and they could do microsurgery to reattach a finger or something like that. Right. But if there was a plane crash and they brought 120 people to that same hospital, they would not be able to do that microsurgery. They couldn't take the time. They couldn't possibly devote that much effort when so many other people were waiting. And you have the triage. So, exactly. And that's what they did. They went down from man to man and they saw someone was shot in the stomach. They would just say, he's going to die, put him over there, there's nothing we can do. This man over here, his arm is shot, his, his uh, cannonball broke his arm, we can amputate it, get it out of the way, and, and that's what they did. And the, was there a carryover from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War as far as you know, battlefront strategy? It's uh, interesting because the textbooks that the generals used were written back before the rifled musket came into being. So when they went to school and when they started off as young men in the military, they were used to dealing with flintlock muskets that were smoothbore that were good for up to 400 yards maximum and usually fought only 100 yards where you would fire one volley and then charge with the bayonet. And it'd be like one big huge shotgun. Yes. And you try to take Everybody out. Everybody fires once and then you charge and right. finish him with the bayonet. Right. Well, when they came up with the rifles that could shoot accurately a greater distance, that complicated things from a number of ways. See, that intrigues me because I, I, I thought maybe the muskets could only, you know, be accurate up to 50 yards, but you say 400 yards. They had sights up to 300 yards. That's amazing. And they are that way. That's equivalent to maybe using a 30 odd six. There's an interesting aspect of Civil War history because back in the 1960s, a group formed called the North-South Skirmish Association. These are target shooting men. They limit themselves to target shooting only with weapons that were used during the Civil War. And they have competitions. Mm -hmm. And they have rapid fire competitions and they have long range competitions. They actually fire cannons with projectiles at targets. Is that? Yes. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to help as a range officer at one North South Skirmish. So event. pull and then fire? Yes. They no actually way. line the cannon up very carefully with a projectile that they cast themselves and they fire and they have competition. Which gun team can hit the target, the bullseye closest? Oh, that's interesting. And that is dramatic. It's, it's the, the whole, there are so many aspects of the Civil War that uh, many people spend their lives researching it without getting tired. Well, I would imagine. Uh, and, and they were actually a little bit more brilliant than we can give them credit for, I would imagine. Very industrious, very oh, yes. resourceful. 
back then, uh, I'm not saying that we're not today, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, they, they had to think a lot of things through, apparently. Um, the books that they read were what we would call the classics. Quite a few of them knew foreign languages and Greek. The foreign observers that came to America during the American Civil War, they were always foreign observers. Just we sent foreign observers over to see the Crimean War. There were foreign observers who came here from England, from France, from Germany. Prussia. They went yeah. back home and they just said, wow, those Americans are so literate. Everybody can read. And they would see American soldiers reading newspapers. And they that, just blew them away. It's like the common soldiers. And, it's like, and they would even say, well, why are you bothering reading the newspaper? You know, you should just p do what you're told to do. And it's like, well, we, we want to see what's going on. And, and that's, that's the, the problem that I have with Hollywood today, uh, in that it makes everybody look like as they were just uh, illiterate. But back then, 80 to 90 percent of our country was literate. Oh, yes. Nowadays, we, we can't claim that. Well, it's, it's interesting because of the 11 states that seceded, only one of them had compulsory education. So you might say that the lack of education was one of the reasons that so many people tried to leave the Union. They didn't understand fully the issues. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody could read and write. Obviously, there were a lot of farm families that couldn't. But yet, you had someone like Abraham Lincoln, who they say learned to write by charcoal on the back of a shovel. There were people out there who genuinely struggled to learn and educate themselves. And the, the people that were learning, that learned Greek, as you mentioned mm -hmm. Greek, that's for, so they could read the Bible. Well, yeah. It would, uh, that I'm sure some people, it, it, they, why would you learn Greek? Because of Koine Greek. The original text was mm -hmm. in, in, in Koine, uh, Koine Greek. And that's, that was part of their education. Yes. Interesting. The, the, I recently saw someone posted online a, um, a sample of a test given at the turn of the century to students. And it was, uh, how do you figure compound interest? And how do you figure the mortgage rates? Things that an average high school person wouldn't even know anything about today, but yet it was an elementary school test. Interesting. The kind of schooling they got in those days was a little more practical than what we get today. Huh. So you brought some artifacts with you today. You, uh, yes, I was mentioning before about some of the things about, um, one of the things we study is the U.S. Army regulations. As a reenactor, there is a need for this, and people actually took the time to make a facsimile reprint of the U.S. Army regulations, which tells you everything you need to know to be a soldier, what forms to fill out, what the uniforms look like. And this is a well-worn copy that I have because I've actually had to memorize this. The whole book? Well, most of it. I've, if you're a Civil War reenactor and you're an officer and they tell you you're in charge of the formation for the uh, roll call, well, I can tell you I spent a few minutes furiously looking for this section of the book to study on how, what does the, the duties of an adjutant, where the adjutant has to form the battalions and call the roll and, and make everything. It's, it's quite interesting because we're lucky we have this material available. So why couldn't uh, wagons uh, march with trains? Well, uh, the way the army marched was the first the men would march, then the trains, which was ammunition and food, and then the wagons with tents and baggage would be behind because it would be foolish to, to march towards a battle and have the ammunition at the back of the line. OK. He because passes the test. I just turned to it. <laughs> now, another aspect, too, is wow. that there are, these are the kind of things that, that we have to study. These, again, are textbooks. Oh, really? These are reprints textbooks. Tactics, uh, infantry. Yes, okay. and this is, this is the most common one that most people study. It's called Hardy's Tactics. This was adopted by the Army at the beginning of the Civil War. And that tells you things about the manual of arms, the duties of a colonel, the duties of a captain, how to form a company. I'm sure there were a lot of time uh, to read, you know, marching, resting, marching, resting, marching, resting, then the battle. Oh, yes. Well, you have to remember, we were a volunteer army, so the vast majority of the people who joined the army had no clue as to what a soldier was to do. They, were no, they had never seen a, a war movie. They had no idea. They had vague notions based on stories of the American Revolution. Right. So there were plenty of stories where, where men who were a banker was voted to be the captain of a company. They go to Washington, D.C., and they suddenly realize, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So they actually had schools, not, not official schools, but they would sit down together, the offices, and they would read through these books. 
and they would learn it as they go along. And a few regular army officers would come around and kind of help. Now, there's a famous uh, academy in New York. Uh, West Point. West Point. Did that come from the Civil War? or is it? The West was Point it? was started in 1802. And a good many of the generals during the Civil War had graduated from West Point, like General Lee, General Grant. Almost all of them had graduated from West Point. Everyone who graduated from West Point graduated with an engineering degree. It was a four-year college. And it was a free four-year college. Hmm. Interesting. Now, you're wearing wool. You're, you're, you're in full gear right now, I can see. Uh, are you hot? No, I'm very quite comfortable. Thank you. Yeah, so when you're marching and you're in this, in this wool, it, it uh, has a cooling effect and uh, also yes. a uh, heating effect. You get effect. used to the uniform. The, this, the, the hot sun on a dark blue fabric is not quite as hot as you might think because it acts as insulation both ways. It keeps the hot sun off of your skin. And your sweat is absorbed from it. And it actually can evaporate, cool you. When you're doing these reenactments, obviously there are going to be some Southerners doing their reenactments. Yes. Are you in the cool of the night uh, yelling out, hey, Johnny Rebel, or hey, uh, you, you know, they would taunt each other in the nighttime? Actually, At least that's as what I heard. in any hobby, we're basically comrades. Right. We know what they're doing. They know what we're doing. As a matter of fact, I used to go into the Confederate camps to meet some friends of mine and sit down with them and talk with them because it was like a reunion. Every year, sometimes you might see the same people. And it, at one point, some Confederate officers didn't want Union soldiers visiting their camp. They wanted to keep it more appropriately authentic. So they would say, we don't want Union guys just walking into the camp, sitting down by a campfire. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the appeal is that in the evenings, especially in the summer, sitting by a campfire, telling stories, passing on your research, it, it's interesting seeing how other people live, where they came from, because people come from all parts of the country. Uh, I, we're losing a lot of our history, aren't we? Yes. As a matter of fact, battlefield preservation is a very uh, big aspect of the hobby of Civil War reenacting. And, and, and why is that important to us? Well, there are places where men died and gave their lives for this country. Their property was private property at the time, and in some cases it's still private property. And some of that property has been bought and developed. And there are people who look at it and they want to visit a historic spot and are disappointed to see a Kentucky Fried Chicken or McDonald's right. on the spot where their great-grandfather fought a battle. I, I heard a saying from a, a teacher of mine, a Mr. Yule, not to know what was before one was, one was mm. is always to remain a child. And uh, for our, our kids not to see an accurate portrayal of what we went through to form this, this nation, uh, it's tragic, and uh, it's actually scary. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, there's quite a controversy about education in this country, about what kids are being taught, and the programs and the, the, the schedules. And unfortunately, American history is being tossed by the wayside. And in some cases, the history that is being taught is not what older generations consider to be the important parts of American background. What makes Americans American? What, what does it mean? Why, if you visit the Capitol, the Capitol building in Concord, why are these glass cases with flags, right. tattered, torn, with bronze plates in front of them? Why did they serve those? Why did they save those? Because the men holding those flags treasured them. Men died holding those flags. Those flags have bullet holes in them. Those flags were important because in a battle, those flags told the general where your men stood so he knew how to maneuver the troops. He would say, move forward, move back. If he saw the flag moving back, he knew your unit was being defeated. If your flag was captured by the enemy, that was an honor that you could, uh, it was a dishonor that your unit could not live down. Right. Interesting. Capturing an enemy flag was, got you the Medal of Honor. I heard it uh, say, that it was, it's been said that, uh, you know, geez, if I had a, a grenade or if I had a bazooka back then, no, that wouldn't have made the difference. The difference was if I had a walkie-talkie. Communications. To, communications was all w one battles. The, um, the history of American military and world military is the history of, of communications. The three R's, command, control, and, and communicate. During the Civil War, 
the telegraph was relatively new and it was used. But it wasn't used during a battle. During a battle, a general would dispatch individual people with notes handwritten. He would scribble it down and he'd pass it on and he'd, the, the commander of that part of the field would get a note saying the general wants you to advance. The general wants you to hold on at all costs. Somebody is coming to help you. And that's what it was. It was all word of mouth. Now, of course, being that there was a telegraph, the generals were getting messages from Washington, D.C., and the southern generals were getting messages from Richmond. And it was actually during the Crimean War in 1854, 1856, there were some French generals quit because they could not stand the idea of somebody else telling them how to run their battle. Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> the same thing with ships. When they started putting radios on ships, ship captains were furious because a captain being commanded of a ship or an admiral in charge of a flotilla, they were God. Nobody could tell them what to do. And they didn't like having to answer to anybody else. Right, this is my, my ship, this is my battle, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll fight it. Uh, oh. One thing is interesting how things is that have changed. we can look back at the actual handwritten notes because they had to keep a file. And we can see what did this general say? And what, why did this battle turn out this way? So is there an event that's coming up soon that uh, you'll yes. be a part of? In uh, June 15th, we're having a memorial ceremony in Francistown, New Hampshire, for one of the men from the 1st New Hampshire Volunteer Cavalry who was seriously wounded during the Civil War. He came home, and he's buried in Francistown, and one of the men on the 1st New Hampshire Cavalry discovered his grave and decided that it would be nice to have a memorial service. So on Saturday, 1 o'clock in the afternoon on June 15th, we're having a ceremony. Also, on June 22nd, 23rd, the Library of Methuen, Massachusetts is sponsoring a Civil War living history encampment on the grounds outside their library. Mm -hmm. At that encampment, I'll be there with the 1st New Hampshire Cavalry. We'll have several men on horseback as cavalrymen. There will be at least one full-size Civil War cannon from the 6th Main Battery, and there will be some members of the infantry from the Lawrence Memorial Guard. And inside the library, there will be speakers on the Civil War, including Steve Blunt from Nashua, who will be giving a talk about the Hutchison family singers who were from Milford, who were very influential during the Civil War and the anti-slavery movement. Interesting. Is there a website that uh, you, you, people can go to to see more about uh, the reenactments? There are, there are so many websites for Civil War reenacting, it's, it's ridiculous. But um, you can go to the New England Brigade and look at their website under their listing of events and see the, the different Civil War events taking place in New England. And there are websites that compile all these Civil War activities. And sometimes it's a, it's a Civil War ball, a dance, where they wear Civil War dresses and Civil War uniforms. Sometimes it's a full battle reenactment. We have opposing sides and they fire cannons, and, all with blanks, of course. And when we do this, it's, it, it can be quite a thrill. And the public does enjoy seeing the spectacle. Before we close, I, mm. I'm going to have to close because we have our, right. other guests coming. but. Um, a little bit more about Lincoln. Uh, you, you had mentioned something about uh, the way Hollywood is portraying him. It could be, uh, from one perspective, it would be, well, that railroad lawyer, or uh, he was more of a devious type of politician. Uh, in your personal studies, what do you take from that? Well, my belief is that you have to look at something from several angles. Right. And I have, when I research, I research a subject from several different sources. And I haven't specifically researched Lincoln, except when I did read his Lincoln-Douglas debates. But I've read enough about him from what other people said about him at the time that he was a genuinely nice person. Right. People said this about him before he died, that he was an upstanding person, very kind. When they met him and spoke to them, he was a, a friendly person. When you he see was that, not a scheming, right. devising person who would look at you out of the side of his head trying to think of what he could do. He was a man genuinely thrown into the middle of a terrible dispute. Right. You have to remember that the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, was sworn in before Abraham Lincoln was sworn in as president. There were states that seceded before he was sworn in. And I didn't know Yes. That. Oh, that's interesting. And it's interesting, too, because um, <laughs> as president-elect, he was getting 50 letters a day from people who were saying, you should do this, you should do that. Once he became president, he was getting 200 letters a day. And Congress had only authorized the president to have one personal assistant. During the war, he got two other men assigned to his office to help handle correspondence. 
Now, I understand right now the White House Greetings Office has 1,500 people answering mail for the president. It shows you how things have changed. Oh, amazing. But Abraham Lincoln had only one man to handle appointments, schedules, and every day he set aside time for people to come in and just sit down with him for a moment and speak to him. And this provided a great many anecdotes, including one man who came from a rural part of America who went to see him and actually took the time to wait inside. And when he was called into the president's office, he went over to a window and looked outside and said, you have a nice view here. And Abraham Lincoln said, yes. And he said, is that tree a maple tree or ash tree? And Abraham Lincoln, being a woodsman, he said, which tree? He says, that one over there. And he leaned out the window to look and he said, I think that's an ash tree, an ash tree. And the, the back woodsman said, why are you looking down there? Wave hello to my wife and kids down there. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln was a genuinely nice person. Of course, he mm. also had a child who died while he was president. Right. Yeah. And his wife was, um, caused him a great deal of grief also because he dearly loved him, her, dearly loved her. But she was a trying person at times. She was a spendthrift. Yeah, one, people say. said that she had a temper and she could yell until her voice failed and her eyes bugged out. Yeah. But he tolerated her. He, he, he genuinely loved her yeah. and respected her. Hey, Bob, I really appreciate you coming to Kevin, the show. All right. Pleasure being here. All right. Please uh, uh, go uh, to these events, and we hope uh, you enjoy it and share uh, our beloved history. Uh, warts and all, you know, we have some good parts, we have some ugly parts, but there we are. We're still one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Until next week, thanks for watching Gate City Chronicles. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Thank <laughs> you.